today is a big day because it's the last day of a 12-week message series that we've been doing through our mission statement, which is to know, love, follow Jesus, and help others do the same. So we spent three weeks on what it is for us to know Jesus, three weeks on what it is for us to love Jesus, three weeks on us what it is for us to follow Jesus, and now we've spent two weeks, and today is the last for three, on us helping others do the same, right? So two Sundays ago, we talked about how Jesus was undoubtedly, unequivocally, others-minded, that he was here to seek and save those who were lost, that he didn't come, that he didn't step out of heaven and come to earth for his own good, for his own health, for, for any of that, but he did it for us. He did it for those that, that didn't know him to offer them a hope and a way to be in communion with him forever, for all of eternity. And then last Sunday, we talked about kind of how we help others love Jesus and how we love others to love Jesus even when they're a pain. Right? How many of you are a pain? Come on, admit it. Amen, amen. Some of you need to raise your hands. All right. <laughs> um, right? But today, we're going to look at and we're going to sum, sum all of this up. There's going to be a very practical message for us today. We're going to sum all of this up in helping others follow Jesus. Helping others follow Jesus. And so again, Colossians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 2 in just a moment. But the church at Colossae, much like a lot of our churches that we see letters to in the New Testament, they were struggling with some things because there was a group of people that were out to confuse for their own gain, for their own good, for their own profit. And so they were going through and facing challenges in their faith. I'm so thankful that we see stories like this in Scripture, passages like this in Scripture, because they give me encouragement when my faith is challenged. And so if you're here this morning, your faith's being challenged, or maybe, maybe you, you would sit and say, you know what, I'm not sure I've ever been a person of faith. Well, this message is perfect for you. Let's see what Paul says to the church at Colossae. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person." And then we, and so I want to pause just, just for a moment because it, 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 this, this summarizes what Paul is, is wrapping up his letter with, this kind of some final instructions to this struggling church that's, that's got some folks in it that are struggling with their faith. And today we're going to talk about reaching your full potential in faith. Reaching your full potential. Reaching your full potential. And reaching your full potential is not just something that God wants you to be interested in for your sake alone, but he wants us to help others reach their full potential. Right? Especially, as we see this in the fourth chapter, God wants those of us who know him to help those who don't know him to find him so that they can reach their full potential. As, as, as Jesus was calling the, the first disciples in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see this often um, that Jesus would call somebody and then he would say, go and, go and tell so-and-so. Go and tell so-and-so. And then that person would go and they would say, come and see. Come and see. Come and see this, this Christ. Come and see this Jesus. And, and, and so Paul is really following the example of Jesus in, hey, go and, go and do likewise. Go tell others about this Christ. Go tell others about this faith. And so how do we help others reach their full potential. What practical steps can we take to help others reach their full potential in God? Number one is this. Never. Everybody say never. never. Not this side again. This side. Y'all, y'all got it. Y'all are awake this morning. Y'all are happy that school's out. Y'all must be in Scarborough where you got two more days of school <laughs> this week, right? But never give up praying. Never give up praying. Look at what Paul says in, in verse 2 to the church of Colossae. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Never give up prayer. 
Never give up prayer for the message of Jesus to be spread. Never give up prayer for the person. There's, there's never a person that is too far beyond the reach of God. Never give up prayer for that person. Right? Never give up praying. Never give up is an admonition in itself, isn't it? Whenever I hear it, I think of Jimmy V, right? Never give up. Don't ever give up, right? Never give up is an admonition in itself. It can be applied in many different areas, but here, Paul in Scripture applies it to prayer. Never give up praying. See, we need to be encouraged not to give up praying for the message of Jesus to be spread. We need to be challenged to never give up praying for the message of Jesus to be spread. How, and, and so my question for you this morning is, have you given up in your prayer life in this area? That, that Jesus would continue to be spread in our culture. That Jesus would continue to be spread in our community. That Jesus would continue to be spread in our family. Because He's still moving, isn't He? And so we should pray that He would still move and, 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 and that the Gospel would still Spread The Word of God and the Spirit of God, I believe, are challenging us today to rekindle our prayer life for others. That knowing, loving, and following Jesus and helping others do the same starts with prayer. Otherwise, who's in control of it? Right? If we're not leaning on the supremacy of God in other people's lives, who's in control of it? See, the first step to healing relationship is praying for the other person. God, give me the strength to not pound them the next time I see them. (laughs) And so so we've got to pray. I I love to tell this story. Two two things about prayer real quick. One, and then I'll tell you the story. Okay? Um, I don't know who, who originated this quote, but I've said it many times. I never pray for more than five minutes, but I never go five minutes without praying. That's exactly what Paul was meaning when he was talking about continue steadfastly in prayer. That we we remember who's in control, who's in charge, who's got this thing, because it's not us. Okay? And so we've got to remember that. There was, a, there was a pastor at one time, his name's Francis Chan, and he used to be a pastor in Simi Valley, California, and now he just, he just writes books and travels around and speaks and, and all of that. And, and, and he told the story uh, in one of his books about, it, uh, about prayer. He told the story about it, the time that he was a pastor, and he had, a, he had about 100, 110 people on his staff, and, and he walks into a staff meeting one day with all of his staff in the room, right? Which is, I mean, it was a small church of about 10,000 people. <clears throat> and um, so they had, they had a pretty big staff. And he walks in one day, and he, and he decides that he needs to challenge his staff. And he stands before them, and he says, If you are not praying for more than an hour a day, I need you to come and tell me after this staff meeting so that I can fire you. Because under whose power and direction are you serving here? And I don't, know, I don't know if anybody went up to him and was bold enough to actually tell him and test him in that. But the illustration is that, right, that we've got to remember who's in charge, who's in control, and that if we're not praying, we're missing step one in life. For the believer, leaning on the person and work of Jesus in our lives. And so that difficult situation that you're walking in right now, that difficult relationship, that difficult kid, that difficult, when's the last time you prayed for them? If you're having an issue with your pastor and you just, you're just struggling with him, you can't stand him, when's the last time you prayed for him? I'm going to send you back to Italy (laughs) or wherever it is you came from. (laughs) So Paul gives some, some, some encouragement here, right? Continue steadfastly in prayer. 
when you pray, he says, keep alert and be thankful. I love that, right? When you pray, stay alert, right? Don't get lazy in your praying. Don't get complacent in your praying. Don't get comfortable, but, but stay alert, be alert, and be thankful. See, watchfulness and thankfulness, they go hand in hand. Because being watchful as you pray, knowing that the enemy is going to probably come and attack you as you're praying. Right? Well, Travis, how can that happen? You've lost your mind. Be thankful that the enemy is attacking us in our prayers means that our prayers are having impact in the unseen world, in the spiritual world, right? And prayer is the oil that keeps, the, that keeps our armor from rusting when it comes to the faith. So not only being watchful and thankful, but pray that God will make a way to share the message. He says in verse 3, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on which I am in a, of which I am in prison, on account of which I am in prison. And so Paul is in prison. He's writing this letter to the church at Colossae. He's, he's giving them instructions, but he says also, pray for me. Because I have a platform here in prison that you don't have. Pray that God would open doors for me to share the gospel here in this cell so that I can further the gospel here. See, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Because some of you work on cars. Bless your hearts. I don't know how to do that. Some of you can work with concrete. That's amazing. Hallelujah. Some of you, some of you build steps. Some of you... Um, some of you build houses. Some of you build things. Some of you protect um, things. Some of you work in, 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 in medical areas and you, and, and you heal people and you help people, right? Others of you, um, I don't know. What do you do? You, some of you just get up and wash the dirty dishes, right? But whatever it is that you do with your hands and feet throughout the day, God has given you a platform, that he has not given any other person in this room. And so we ought to pray for each other in our platform. Teachers, we ought to pray for you as you're going to those schools. Medical folks, we ought to pray for you. Right? Labor folks, we ought to pray for you. We, we've got to be praying for one another because God can use you in ways that He can't use the person across the room because they don't have the same platform as you do. There are some of you in this room that have more opportunity to lead someone in your life to Christ than I ever will. Than I ever will. Because I can't speak the language I turn on a NASCAR race and they might as well be speaking Chinese. I don't understand it. It's a bunch of people turning left <laughs> at high velocity. Right? Or if you're in this room and you watch a fishing show, you know what I call that? Nap time. <laughs> Once again, I don't speak that language. But you know what I'll be doing this evening? Watching golf. I just lost three quarters of the room. <laughs> Right? And some of you are like, that's my nap time. Well, amen. Right? You s prove, prove, proves the point. God has platformed each and every one of us. And Paul's prayer here, Paul's prayer here is that we would continue, continue steadfastly in prayer, that he would use us in our platforms. And then he says, pray also for me. That even though I'm in this prison, that God would give me the opportunity to share the truth of his gospel here, presently. And then lastly, pray that the message would be as clear as possible. He says in verse 4, that I might make it clear which is how I ought to speak. That I might make it clear which is how I ought to speak. He says pray for the clarity. Pray for the words to say that, that I might make the message of Jesus so clear, so undoubtedly clear that people would receive it and embrace it. So we've got to keep watchful in prayer. Number two, we've got to imitate Jesus in our relationships. Now we talked about this a lot last Sunday, but it's interesting that it shows up again right here in this text, in Paul's letter to the church of Colossae, he's giving these final instructions that we would imitate Jesus in our relationships. Now we know Ephesians 5, 6 says, 
uh, excuse me, Ephesians 5, 1, imitate Christ, therefore, as his dear children. So this is something we ought to do in life. But here Paul says to the church at Colossae, specifically, imitate Jesus in your relationships. Look at verses 5 and 6 again. He says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious. He could have left that out, couldn't he? Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you might know how to answer each person. Now, why does he say seasoned with salt? Salt does two things, right? It preserves, right? Seasoned with salt. So we're preserving the true message of the gospel, but otherwise, salt for some of you, okay, for, for me, for me, I'm not one of those people that has to dump a half a bottle of salt onto a meal to make it taste good, okay, right? But bless your heart if that's you. I'm not, I'm not being critical that this is not convicting. Don't let that be the only thing you hear and then tune me out for the rest of the message, okay? We're just different. Remember, we've got different platforms. You've got a salt platform. I've got a regular, pure, natural taste platform, okay? You're extremist. I'm normal, okay? It's okay, right? God needs us both in his kingdom, okay? But not only does salt preserve, but salt adds flavor, right? Salt adds flavor. And what Paul is saying here is that let our speech always be seasoned with salt so that we can engage people in conversations instead of turning them away. Instead of turning them away. That we, that our speech would be so seasoned with salt. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever walked up to a person, maybe in a, maybe at a circus or someplace that's fun and, 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 and uh, like the Freiburg Fair, right? The, the ticket, the ticket takers at the Freiburg Fair, they're not having much fun, Right? <laughs> And if we use them as the poster child for the Freiburg Fair, as opposed to the fried Oreos and the turkey legs and all of the other things that make the Freiburg Fair the Freiburg Fair, right? Then we would look at that and say, that's not fun. Right? That's not fun. But you look at a teacher on the last day of school, and what are they doing? You can't rain on their parade. You can't rain on their parade. Right? Right? They're celebrating. It's exciting, right? When you walk into the house of God, when you walk into the body of Christ on a Sunday morning, right? It should not be. If our greeters open the door and like, get in. (laughs) Come on. Come on, get in there, right? Or if they, this happened one time. This happened one time. I kid you not. This, this is one of the 87 reasons that we stop passing an offering bucket, right? Or if that usher passes you with the offering bucket and they shake it, oh. <laughs> right? And they shake it, right? Go find another church. Now, quickly, right? Right? Because that's not seasoned with salt, right? That's not seasoned with salt. Paul tells the church at Colossae, That when we speak, when we relate to people that don't have a relationship with Jesus, that do have a relationship with Jesus, that as a believer in Christ, that our speech should be gracious, full of grace, mm, and seasoned with salt. Always ready to engage in conversation. Always ready to talk about the love and the hope of Jesus Christ in a way that preserves the true gospel, that doesn't put, the wor- that doesn't put words in Jesus' mouth that he never said, to preserve the true gospel and make it appealing to people. Now, that doesn't mean twist the truth to make it appealing, the seeker sensitive. I'm not, I'm not going there, Right? But how do you make something appealing to somebody? Two Tuesdays ago, I had the most amazing dessert I've ever had in my entire life. 
It was called the ooey gooey brownie. Now let me tell you about this brownie, because typically I hear the word brownie and I'm out. Because I'm not a big fan of chocolate. Ease up, okay? (laughs) You salt people, just sit down, okay? Okay? But this was a vanilla brownie. And so I I embraced Jesus in my life all over again and got all excited. It's a warm brownie. And then the ooey gooeyness is that they put about three, four, maybe five scoots of ice cream on top of it and douse it in caramel and fudge and all kinds of other goodness. Let me tell you something. When I met Jesus again two Tuesdays ago, when I tell you that, I mean, I met. And, and here's the best part about it. You could get as much as you wanted because it was included in your price. I can't tell you that. It's not in this state. It's at Magic Kingdom, Disney World. And so it's even more magical, right? And, and, and I had this, and it was amazing. And you know what my first thought was? I want everybody I know to have this. I want everybody I know to have this. Everybody's got to have this. And, and, the, and the waiter, he was awesome. He was like, well, you know, if you go to, to like my Disney experience or whatever, it's in the cookbook that you can buy for $74.95. <laughs> right? Like you can, you can buy it and you can have it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to make this right? I just want more of it to continue to come out, right? Now, how many of you are ready to go to Magic Kingdom and have the ooey gooey brownie? A few of you, right? You see what I just did there? The best way for you to have your speech when it comes to the gospel of Jesus preserved with salt and taste better. And so walk up to somebody and tell them a personal experience about how you experienced God in your life. Hands down. The, the best message that you have to spread the gospel of Jesus is how he has moved in your life. Because no one can get as passionate about your story as you can. No one. No one can get excited as excited about God in your story as you can. We can get excited with you, but we can't share the same passion that you can. Because you've got to experience it. Right? You've got to experience it for yourself. And so as you've experienced it for yourself, that's what Paul is saying is go and tell others about the hope that you have in Jesus and about what He's done in your life about what he's done in your life because no one can get as excited about your story as you can. And so that's how we season it with salt. Choose your words carefully. Be pleasant. Hold people's interest when you share the good news. All of these things are important as we think about imitating Jesus in our relationships. Walking in wisdom, making the best use of the time, letting our speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that we might know how to answer each person. Then number three, get involved in the lives of others. Get involved in the lives of others. Now, for for this, let's look at verses 7 through 18. Okay? There's a reason I saved this for the end. Okay? Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant of the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are. And that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that's taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. Verse 11, And Jesus, who is called Justice, there are... Uh, there are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epiphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. For I bear witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea. 
and Air, Airpolis. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. We see in this letter, in the closing of this letter to the church at Colossae, that Paul was no doubt ingrained in the lives of others. He knew them. He knew that two of them were Colossians. He said, he said these, are, these, are, these are one of you. And they've been praying for you. Paul was intimately involved in the lives of these people that he writes about. So how do we apply that to our lives today? I'm glad you asked. Get involved in the lives of other people by being an encourager. By encouraging someone. By telling someone, hey, you know what? You're doing a great job. You're doing a phenomenal job. You're doing a great job. Uh, in verses 7 through 9, we see uh, Tychicus and Onesimus, Paul sent them to cheer the Colossians up. He, he sent them specifically to cheer the people up. You need to get involved in the cheering up ministry. It's so good to see you. I'm so excited to see you. You're doing a phenomenal job at this. See, if we follow Jesus, we want to help others reach their full potential, and we want to cheer one another up. One of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. His name was John Wooden. Anybody ever heard of John Wooden? Okay. He coached at UCLA. All right. Ten national championships. This is collegiate. Okay. We will never talk of the NBA in this room. Okay. He was a collegiate basketball coach, UCLA. Ten national championships in 13 years. Ten out of 13. Right? How did he do it? One of his instructions to his players that was a rule on their team that whenever a basket was made, the player who scored the basket was required to smile, wink, nod, or point to the player that passed them the ball. Right? So, somebody passes me the ball, I shoot, make the basket, duh. Right? What am I doing? Right? I'm pointing to Rob. I'm saying, yep, thank you. Good pass. Right? One of the players in, in, in one of the players asked the coach one time, well, what if he's not looking? What if he's not looking when I point and nod and say good pass or thank you? By the way, this has been picked up by college basketball program after college basketball program. It is not unlikely to see this happen after made baskets on the college basketball court. It's really cool. Right, it's really cool. In fact, the Carolina basketball team has adopted it as the Carolina way, even though they stood it from, stole it from John Wooden. That's what we do in Carolina. We just s steal good ideas. Anyway, that's why I got out, okay? Right? So one of the players looks at Coach Wooden and says, what if he's not looking? And Coach Wooden's response was amazing. He said, they'll be looking. Everyone's always looking for affirmation. And appreciation. Oh. Everyone's always looking for affirmation and appreciation. And the player was interviewed and he said, sure enough, every time I made a basket and I went to point or nod at the player that passed it to me, they were always looking. Cheer up. Cheer up. Make the best of the tough days and find a way to encourage those close to you. Find a way to bless someone around you. As you go eat lunch today, find a way to thank the person serving you, even if they pour your Diet Coke all down the front of you. Thank you, I was warm. <laughs> I'm not anymore. 
you're amazing. Right? Find a way to be cheerful. Because, because here's the thing, and I get pretty passionate about this. You see the cross up on the stage. Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we as Christians could reflect the most boring culture of all. He didn't. Church, uh, Sunday mornings should not be the most boring times of the week. If they are, we're doing it wrong. It doesn't mean it should be a joke. It doesn't mean it should be, it doesn't mean it shouldn't be challenging. It doesn't mean it shouldn't be, it, it, it doesn't mean that it, it, it should be a, 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 a water or, or, or milk or whatever, but it, but it means that we should be excited that we get the chance to come into a place freely opening the Word of God, freely talking about the hope that we have in Jesus, freely helping others embrace Him in their difficult lives, because this is why Jesus died. This is why He came. So that the church could be active, seasoned with salt, gracious in their speech, involved and engaged in the lives of other people. So cheer up. Before you leave today, pay three compliments to somebody, even if it's the same person. Because what happens is when you're cheerful and you compliment the lives of others, guess what? It makes you happier too. It makes you happier. Get, in the vol- get involved in the, in the lives of others just by being there. Not only by, by being an encourager, but just by being there. We talked about this last week. Aristarchus was in jail with Paul. They were together. Paul had someone with him just to be there. And isn't it important that when you're going through a tough time just to have somebody be there? Just show up. You will never, you never know how much that will impact a person. Just be there. Just show up. And then lastly, get involved in the lives of others by being a comforter. By praying for them. By offering practical help. By comforting them. By opening up your home. Uh, we see in verse 15, Nympha and Laodicea, they hosted a house church in their home. And hospitality can be one of the greatest barriers to remove, uh, excuse me, one of the greatest barrier removers to the good news about Jesus. So, we never give up praying, right? We imitate Jesus in our relationships and we get involved in the lives of others. That's how Paul says to help others follow Jesus. Oh, I want to point your attention to John 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It's not going to be on the screens. Sorry, sorry, Dave. It's not going to be on the screens, but John chapter 4. Many of you know it as the story of the woman at the well. Now, I wish we had time to dive into the woman at the well story, okay? But, but we don't. But essentially, here, here's the deal, okay? Jesus ends up passing through a place that he should not have been passing through. Kind of went out of the way to, to pass by this woman because I, I, I think he knew she was going to be there, right? And this woman who's outcast from her culture, hated, avoided, not liked, is at a well drawing water. And Jesus stops to talk to her against the better judgment of, of his followers. His followers are like, no, let's, let's go. We got to go. We got to get a snack. We got a lunch reservation. Jesus, we got to get to it, okay? And Jesus sends them on ahead so that he can stay and have an encounter with this woman, okay? The end of the encounter Jesus says, but the hour is coming, it's verse 23, and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, He who is called the Christ, and when He comes, He will tell us all these things. And Jesus, last thing He says to her, I who speak to you. Am he. This woman, unlikely, 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 
has now had an encounter with Jesus, just like Zacchaeus last week, the wee little man in the tree, the sycamore tree, unlikely had an encounter with Jesus. You see a trend here that Jesus comes for the outcast. Jesus comes for the unlikely. That if you feel like you're too damaged for Jesus, you're in a great place because He still desires you. Just then the disciples came back. They marveled that He was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? And why are you talking with her? Probably because they were too scared that Jesus would put them in their place. I wish Jesus would have been at the Southern Baptist Convention this past week. But anyway, sorry. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man that told me all that I ever did. Can this be a Christ? Can this be the Christ? Excuse me. And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Now I want you to see this. Jesus didn't tell that woman, Hey, Go, never give up praying. Go and imitate Jesus, imitate me in your relationships, right? Go and get involved in the lives of others. It was a natural response for her. That she had had such an encounter with Jesus. She had had the most amazing experience. And she goes in as an outcast to people that want nothing to do with her. And she's tapping people on the shoulder. Hey, I know you're trying to feed your family. But you need to stop for just a moment. And you need to come with me and meet someone that told me everything I ever did. Yeah, all the stuff that's filling your dinner conversations about my sin and my past and my life as you're gossiping about me. You need, to, you need to cut all of that out because he just told me all that I ever did and he loved me anyway. Hey, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know you're busy. I know you're trying to make life happen. I know you're trying to raise your kids. I know you're trying to, I know you're trying to work. I know you're trying to be faithful. I know you're trying to heal your marriage, but you need to stop for just a second. You need to come with me. You need to meet a man that told me everything I ever did and loved me anyway, because I think he loves you too. You need to stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing and come with me. Because I just met someone, I just had an experience, and I want you to have it. Can you imagine this? Someone has outcast you, and they are the first people that you go back to with the best news that you've ever heard, ever received. Talk about, talk about counter. These people have put you out. These people have disgraced you. You're going to get water in the afternoon just so you can avoid the other women at the watering hole because you don't want to experience the shame and the embarrassment that you've experienced time and time again from these same people and yet you encounter Jesus and the first natural inclination is for you to go and tell them about the experience that you've had with Jesus so that they can come and do the same. That's supernatural. That's supernatural. There's no logical explanation for this. Aside from the Spirit's leading and the Spirit's grace in giving her the strength to go face the people that had, had, that had led her to so much shame and embarrassment for her sin, and say, Come. You got to come with me. You got to drop what you're doing. I know you're busy. I know, I, I know, I know, I know, I know you think you'll get to him in 10 years when the kids are grown. I, I know, I know you think you've got forever, but you need to stop what you're doing and you need to come right now and meet this man. And look what happens. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down for just a minute. No, I won't. Let's read the whole thing. Verse 31, he says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, you got to eat. But he said to him, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? What is he talking about? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Oh, that the church would adopt that. Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. 
Summit Church, the fields are white for harvest today. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Different platforms, different responsibilities, all in the kingdom of God that get to rejoice together. That's the beauty of the church. Verse 36. Woo! Verse 36. And we almost skipped this. Verse 37. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So he teaches the disciples basically the lesson of what he's just done with this woman. And then verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. Many Samaritans believed and followed Jesus not because that woman had a theological degree, because they didn't exist yet, but because of the woman's testimony of the ooey gooey brownie Jesus goodness. <laughs> Come, meet someone told me everything I ever did and loved me anyway. And many Samaritans believed. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. As the worship team is coming this morning, what we see in Colossians 4 and John 4 this morning is the mandate to use our lives, all of it, even the parts we think Jesus wants nothing to do with or could never use to help others follow him, to help others pursue him. This is the call of the house of God. This is the call of the church. That we would first, in all things, pray. Pray. Pray over ourselves and the, and the needs that we have and the, things that, and, 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 the, and the things that we're walking through. And pray for the platforms and, and, and other people that we might be able to share the good news and of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. But pray to imitate Jesus in our relationships. Like we talked about last Sunday, to believe positive intent. To, to, to trust that the leaders of the church are not just trying to upset me or make me mad or to trust that my husband didn't mean to be lazy and not do the dishes, but that he had a reason that he wanted the house to smell like this. <laughs> For some reason, unbeknownst to me, that's a little far-reaching, but you get the point. It's Father's Day, Okay. To imitate Jesus in our relationships, grace-filled relationships, seasoned with salt. To get involved in the lives of others. To not be so closed off, but to get involved in the lives of others. To experience Jesus ourselves, and to get involved in the lives of others. It was clear to me, as I read through that Colossians 4 passage and read all those names, Paul knew them. Paul knew the challenges, knew the, knew the things, knew their backgrounds, knew their gifts, knew their strengths, knew their weaknesses. Paul was involved in the lives of others. And if he can do that in and out of prison for the sake of Christ, we can do that today. My question for you is this. Is the mission of Jesus to follow Him to love Him, to know Him, and to help others do the same. The question in all of this, the question that we've been getting at for 12 weeks, is this. Is it important enough to you? Is it important enough to you? 
Is the mission of Jesus important enough to you to leave your water at the well? And because of the experience that you had with Jesus, go and tell some people, hey, stop what you're doing because you need to come to Jesus. And guess what? I'm going to go with you. I'm going to take you. I'm going to take you. That is where we've got to get to today. The church is more than a 60 to 120 minute show. Where our ears get tickled. Where we play the songs that we like. On tempo. And we sing on key. That will not happen here because I sing here. And realize that it's more than that. That eternity is on the line for someone in this room. That someone in this room is hurting and they don't know what what they're going to do tomorrow. That's, That's someone in this room's marriage is falling apart. And we would never know it. Because we're not involved in the lives of one another. Because we're not all about the mission that Jesus has given us to be His church. Because we'd rather just consume the entertainment. And can I tell you that that is not why we're here. That is not why we're here. We are here to know Jesus. Know Him. Know Him. We're here to love Him. We're here to follow Him. We're here to help the person across the aisle do the same. Will you get on board with that? Will you embrace that mission with me? Father, today, I pray that your church be brought back to what your intention was when you birthed it. When the church in Acts was born, you sent them to be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They devoted themselves to one another, to, the, to you. And God, today I pray that as we've gotten, some of us have gotten off track from that, have gotten distracted from that, God, I pray that you call us back to the original mission statement of your church. God, that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be about the thing that we've made it. It wouldn't be about how far I had to park from the front door today. It wouldn't wouldn't be about the song list. It wouldn't be about an ooey gooey brownie. But it would be about you and what you have for your people. And God, I, I know the stories that we read in Scripture like Paul's letter to the church at Colossae and John 4 and this woman at the well. God, you want those stories today. You're the same God today that worked those miracles then. And so God, today I pray for each and every person in here that they would devote themselves back to you. That they would devote themselves back to prayer that they would devote themselves back to getting involved in the lives of others. And that we would do it all for your glory, for your name's sake. In Jesus' name I pray.